Hi guys, in this lecture we will start developing the blade element theory which is um, a different theory to uh, the, the actuator disk theory that allows you to estimate, uh, calculate and design uh, propellers and the blades in a much more accurate way with slightly less assumptions but calculation processes that are a bit more complicated. First of all, what is blade element theory? The first thing I want to do is explain to you this diagram on top of the slide. It basically shows you how we consider a blade in uh, this theory. So we start from the center line of the hub about which the propeller is rotating and then we progress towards the tip of the blade which is basically the other extremity. And when we talk about the section in this theory, what we mean is imagine you just cut through the propeller at the blade, sorry, of the propeller at some section AA and then removed, removed that part that is um, towards the tip and then just looked towards the hub uh, at eye level with uh, the remaining of the blade, uh, with the blade being horizontal. And basically it allows you to look at the blades um, as a uh, their airfoil shape, airfoil shape, sorry, at a certain uh, section, okay? And that distance dr that you can see is the width of each section. So basically, the thinner and the smaller they are, the more accurate your calculations would be for a specific blade. However, of course, uh, because there will be more sections, you will require uh, more computational power and to do more calculations, which can take uh, a lot more time. So unlike actuated disk theory, blade element theory allows to take into account the shape of the blades. You can basically look at their airfoil shape and how this impact, uh, impacts sorry, the flow around them, around them. So the blade being studied uh, in the blade element theory is usually divided into a number of small sections along its length that act independently of surrounding elements and this means that we consider the flow as two dimensional okay we only consider the flow as if uh, each section doesn't have any impact uh, on each other which of course in real life is not true because as the propeller rotates um, it really shakes around the air and create vortices that leads each section to have some kind of an impact uh, aerodynamically on each other so this theory in the end, because of that, works very well for lightly loaded two or three bladed propellers uh, except near the hub. And this makes sense because the less blade, blades you have, uh, basically the more independent they are from each other. And also the lower uh, the propeller is, lowered, is loaded, meaning the less power is actually going through the propeller, uh, the least kind of unstable and turbulent the flow is. And of course, the hub is a geometry that is so different to that of the blade. Uh, the impact on uh, each, other, each section is more important, and this makes the calculations less accurate because, as we said, we are considering the flow as two-dimensional, whereas in real life, it is, of course, three-dimensional. The first thing I want to talk about within blade element theory is solidity, which is basically a way to check whether blade element theory can be valid and accurate enough uh, in certain uh, configurations uh, and situations, meaning with different uh, propeller blades, essentially, which propellers can work with blade element theory. So individual propeller blades can be assumed to operate in isolation without interference from other blades when the spacing to cold ratio is sufficiently high. And this can be expressed by the dimensionless ratio S over C, uh, which must be much greater than 1. Okay? And here S is the spacing or the circumferential distance between the blades and the cold C, the width of the blade between its leading and trailing edge. And actually, solidity can then be expressed as sigma equals BC divided by by pi r, with b the number of blades and r the radius. And that's what uh, this kind of ratio sigma, the solidity, is checking. It's how much blades uh, do I have, uh, so I mean how much actual solid blade material do I have within 
uh, the, cir the circular is essentially circumference of the propeller. So that's why pi r measures, right? Pi r measures, gives a measure of the size of the propeller as a disc, and then BC checks how much of that space are we taking with uh, blades, okay? And blade element theory is only valid if sigma is uh, much more than one, uh, meaning that the space taken by the blades is uh, much more uh, than uh, the actual uh, size of the propeller itself, essentially pi r. So in blade element theory, propeller blades are divided into smaller elements and sections. Then a force balance is applied to each section to produce lift and drag, and therefore by adding everything up together for all the blades, uh, to calculate uh, the propeller's thrust and torque. And the section local flow velocity is the vector summation of the actual flow velocity Vx, which is basically uh, the forward velocity of the air uh, that the propeller is seeing. It would be V disk, essentially, in uh, actuated disk theory. And the angular flow velocity V theta, which is basically derived from uh, the rotational velocity of the propeller. So the two have to be taken into account to really see what uh, direction and velocity of wind and airflow each uh, section of the blade is actually seeing. And to make this clearer, I invite you to look, uh, look sorry, at the diagram on the top right. You can see here how we look at a section or an element in blade element theory. As uh, I told you before, we are looking towards the hub and we can see the blade, its shape, uh, and its uh, essentially angle of attack. So let me explain everything a bit better. The zero lift line is basically the line at which if uh, the propeller blade, basically if this line was horizontal and of course uh, the propeller blade is uh, stuck to that line, okay, so if you move down the line the propeller uh, blade would move down as much, and if that line is horizontal, the uh, blade, I mean that section of the blade will not produce any lift, okay? So what you can see here starting from the right is the angle theta, which is the angle of uh, that zero lift line. And then you have the actual flow velocity and the radial flow velocity, uh, so we respectively Vx and V theta, which come into play. And then if you do the magnitude um, and you basically take into account both of these vectors to get the actual flow velocity that the blade is seeing, is seeing sorry, which is V, you can then calculate the difference between the uh, angle of that flow, uh, so the angle V basically, and uh, the actual uh, zero lift line, which is really the effective angle of attack of the blade, okay? It doesn't matter the actual horizontal distance of the zero lift line, basically theta, because what matters is actually from which direction is the wind coming, and you want to make the difference between that angle, that direction, and the angle of the zero lift line, and this becomes your angle of attack alpha, okay? And from that, we can obtain uh, the lift produced by that section, which is delta L, and the drag produced by that section, which is delta D, and basically, uh, using the angle theta with basic trigger trigonometry, we can actually calculate for that section of the blade what is the thrust that is produced, the delta, the delta T, and what is uh, the radial force that is produced, which is delta F theta. So, as the propeller's blades are set at a given geometric pitch angle theta, the local flow velocity creates a flow angle of attack alpha. So again, the difference in angle between the lift and thrust vectors is phi equals theta minus alpha. And using basic trigonometry, we can write that the elemental thrust and circumferential force are respectively delta T equals delta L, which is the lift created by the section, multiplied by cos phi, which is again the difference between theta and alpha, minus delta D multiplied by sinus of phi.
and then the circumferential force at that section is equal to the drag at that section multiplied by the cosinus of the cosinus of phi plus a delta l multiplied by the sinus of phi. Okay, so we're basically just taking the components of lift and drag, um, and then I mean in each direction, and then converting them into thrust and a circumferential uh, force. So the, to the torque required to turn uh, the element of the blade in question, the element we're looking at, is actually delta Q, which is the torque, uh, which is equal to uh, the distance from the hub, which is, I mean, not the hub, the center line of the hub, basically the axis about which the propeller is being rotated. Uh, so the distance between that axis and uh, the circumferential force delta F theta that you just calculated. So here, of course, R is the distance between the element and the axis of rotation of the propeller. We now need to calculate the actual lift and drag produced by each element. And to do that, it's very simple. All we need to do is apply the lift and drag equations to each element of our blade as follows. We have delta L, the lift, uh, is equal to rho the air density at sea level in kilograms per cubic meters multiplied by V, the airflow velocity in meters per second, and that is squared, uh, and then divided by 2 multiplied by the coefficient of lift CL multiplied by the cold C multiplied by DR, C and DR being in um, meters. And it's very easy to see here that actually C times DR is the surface area of each uh, element of the blade and CL if you're not familiar with it already is basically a number that takes into account all the values and complications of the real world that can, un that can only be calculated experimentally uh, and then allows us to get an accurate value for lift of course CL is a value that needs to be obtained experimentally for each cases and you can find this online uh, for different kind of objects. It's not, it's not very different in each situation. It's always roughly the same, but the more accurate your CL, the more accurate uh, your lift. Um, and for example, CL we take, will take into account the roughness of your element, so how much it's shaking the floor around and you know, uh, how, how is the boundary layer staying attached to it. Uh, it takes into account the impact of the shape of the airfoil, you know, basically what is the pressure difference, how does it create lift, and so on. So we then have uh, the drag delta D, uh, it's calculated exactly the same way, uh, the, the only difference here is that we use a different coefficient and here it's actually the coefficient of drag uh, CD uh, which is calculated in the same way but this time taking into account uh, the drag so it will be of course a different value that takes into account the shape of the airfoil uh, and other parameters to make sure that this calculation gives us the right uh, drag value. Eventually, we can calculate the total thrust and torque produced by the propeller uh, by summing up uh, each at the, the values of thrust and torque for each element uh, and each blade. So the way we'll usually do that is you'll basically calculate one element multiplied by the number of blades and then move on to the next element and then you'll just keep on summing all this stuff, right? So here what we're doing is, first of all, we can calculate the actual thrust uh, produced by each element, which is rho v squared divided by 2 multiplied by CL times cos phi minus CD times sine phi. You remember what all, all these values are from the previous slides. Uh, multiplied by C multiplied by DR, and then you can multiply this by B, which is the number of blade, and that gives you the exact value for, um, you know, the this very location of elements for all the blades essentially. And we can do the same thing for the torque which is delta Q equals rho v squared divided by 2 multiplied by CL, CL sorry, times sinus of phi plus CD times cos phi multiplied by C uh, dr and then multiplied by R to get the torque and then in eventually multiplied by B to get uh, the value of torque for all the elements at the same level on each blade. And once that's done, you can move on to the next element, uh, and then the next, and the next, and so on, and keep on summing up all these values until you have 
uh, the total thrust and torque for each element uh, on every blade. So this concludes uh, this uh, first lecture on blade element theory. There's a few others until we get those full theories sorted out and then we will move into uh, implementing it into uh, MATLAB code. So I try as usual to make this as clear as possible. Some of it can be quite challenging so just take your time uh, to go through the material uh, and please don't hesitate to ask me any questions. I'm always available to help you. Thank you very much guys.